We need to understand the systems of power that we are operating inside of mm -hmm. in order to be able to essentially break out of them. Welcome to Layer Zero. Layer Zero is a podcast of unscripted conversations with the people that make up the Ethereum community. Crypto is built by code, but it's composed by people. And each individual member of the crypto community has their own story to tell. The cypherpunks understood that the code they write impacts the people that use it. And Layer Zero focuses on the people behind the code, because Ethereum is people all the way down, and it always has been. Today on Layer Zero, I'm talking to Parker J. Pachirat, who is a venture capitalist at FinTech Collective and also a core member of the Boys Club. And Parker and I resonated with, with each other when we found that what we're interested in in our backgrounds, people think are actually like very far away from crypto. My background in psychology and hers in what is called critical theory. Uh, we're talking about college majors here. But actually, there are things that are very directly related to what is at the basement level of crypto. Uh, and so Parker and I had this hour-long conversation just unpacking what is critical theory and what are these things about like power structures in crypto and how crypto is changing the form factors of power structures and what a power structure really is and how things like DAOs and social movements and NFTs are allowing for new power structures to be expressed by still, but still not by changing the rules of how power structures begin in the first place. So I think you guys are really going to enjoy a conversation that is very close to the metal as to what we are doing here in the crypto space, which is disrupting power and also creating new power structures, hopefully ones that are fundamentally better and more expressive and are more aligned with the people that are inside of them. So without further ado, we'll go ahead and get right into the conversation with Parker right after we talk to some of these fantastic sponsors that make the show possible. In all of my years in crypto, I have never been hacked, scammed, or lost money to a thief. And a lot of that credit goes to my Ledger hardware wallet. The Ledger Nano X and the Ledger Nano S Plus hardware wallets allow users like you and me to secure and manage all of our crypto assets and our NFTs, all with the security of storing users' private keys offline and out of reach from hackers. The Ledger Nano X is the perfect hardware wallet for managing your crypto and NFTs on the go because it connects to your phone with Bluetooth and has a nice big screen for easy transaction readings. Ledger has also upgraded the iconic Ledger Nano S and made the new Ledger Nano S device more DeFi and NFT friendly, making it the perfect hardware wallet for beginners. Ledger has truly maximized for both ease of use and security. So discover which Ledger device is best suited for your journey by going and visiting shop.ledger.com. Nexo is your financial hub for all your crypto needs. Nexo lets you buy crypto instantly with your credit or debit card or via bank transfer. And they also have an awesome advanced trading platform, Nexo Pro, where you can get the best possible prices and trade with 50% discount on fees. And Nexo also lets you earn interest on your crypto in Bitcoin, ETH, or other assets. And they also give you an instant crypto line of credit with as low as 0% APR. And they also give you access to a crypto-backed MasterCard of course, earning you more crypto when you use it. So enhance your financial life with Nexo, who ensures all credit lines are over collateralized with insurance on all custodial assets. Nexo, the right place for your crypto. So click the link in the show notes to join over 5 million users who are getting the most out of their crypto. If you've been listening to Bankless, you know that we're fans of the modular blockchain thesis. The idea that blockchains will separate execution from data availability and consensus, allowing all three to become the best versions of themselves and fuel has built the fastest modular execution layer in the industry. By supporting parallel transaction execution, Fuel unlocks significantly faster throughput for the web free world. Fuel also goes beyond the limitations of the EVM with its own Fuel VM, which is more efficient and optimized, opening up the design space for developers. And lastly, Fuel brings a powerful developer experience with its own domain-specific language, Sway, and a supportive tool chain called Fork. With Fuel, you can have the benefits of smart contract languages like Solidity while adopting the improvements made by the Rust tooling ecosystem, letting the Fuel development environment go beyond the limitations of the EVM. If you want to learn more, there's a link in the show notes to see how you can get involved with the Fuel network. What's up, Parker? How's it going? Hi. Great. How are you? Good. Good. Uh, Parker, what would you say that you do in crypto? I am an early stage investor mm -hmm. um, in both crypto startups and tokens, and I also am on the founding team of Boys Club, which is a social club, DAO, and community focused on women and non-binary builders in Web3. And how would you say you got here? Great question. <laughs> um, it's been a 
long and wild journey, I would say. Mm -hmm. Um, I grew up in a very activist family, going to protests, um, Mm -hmm. super lucky to be super well-traveled, and uh, attended a school that was very liberal, liberal Mm -hmm. arts school, um, and took a major there called critical theory. Yeah, Um, and that is how you came to be here in the studio with me today. Yes, indeed. Um, so within, within that major, um, we were really interrogating systems of power. Um, Mm -hmm. most people in the major go on to work for a nonprofit or start their own or do some kind of activism lawyering. Um, but around my second year in uni, I somehow stumbled across an article about the ethics of AI. Mm. Um, and that led me into this deep uh, tech rabbit hole. I was like staying up every night, researching, reading about brain machine interfaces, tech, space, um, a lot of like bleeding edge tech. Mm-hmm. Um, started working for a few startups, worked for a VC. Um, and I think one thing to note here would be most people that I was surrounded by at the time were actually very anti tech. Mm. Um, and anti-capitalism, anti-entrepreneurship. Um, and I actually started making a lot of connections between what I was studying in school and the opportunity that I saw this tech present um, to create better systems in the world. Mm-hmm. I knew about crypto for a while. Like I knew it existed. I knew tokens were a thing. Um, my light bulb moment really happened when I started looking deeper into blockchain technology. Um, and I had this moment of really realizing, wow, just like all of these other innovations and inflection points that have come before it, right? Like the internet, AI, the World Wide Web, um, all of that, blockchain technology presents not only a tremendous opportunity to reimagine our financial system, but mm-hmm. also to reimagine how we coordinate um, how we exchange value, how uh, we mobilize, um, how we express identity and privacy. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, that, that made me want to get involved. Okay, so the, the valence of what you were up to before crypto was uh, liberal upbringing, very like, uh, politically motivated, uh, yes. but, and then, but also, uh, unlike your peers or cohort perhaps, more uh, tech accepting or tech optimist uh, than than the people that you surrounded yourself with, and also I'm getting the the gist of somebody who uh, is perhaps a little obsessive uh, and futurist and a little sci-fi, uh, and also can connect things like things like political science and tech and AI and the current state of like society. This is kind of like the gist I've gotten uh, from you from talking to yeah. you just now, but also uh, previously. And this this light bulb moment for you, for me came when we were talking about your major critical theory. Maybe we should uh, go down that rabbit hole first, because I think that it will help define the rest of this this podcast. What is critical theory? I had never heard of this major before. And, and uh, how did you just resonate with it so much? That's a great question. Um, so the major actually is only offered at the university I attended. So it's mm-hmm. like very niche. Sure. Um, and like I said before, at its heart, it's an interrogation of systems of power. Um, it's very interdisciplinary mm-hmm. in the sense that it draws upon um, everything from philosophy to anthropology to political science. Um, so a lot of social sciences. Mm-hmm. Um, and it aims to combine different kinds of methodology with uh, practice and practice. And I'd say its overarching aim um, is to explore, interrogate, and uncover systems of power that are widely taken for granted and challenge a lot of the normative assumptions um, in our society um, with the ultimate goal of, um, you know, fostering students who can create social change. Um, And I actually think back uh, to that time, right? And think back to, um, you know, like I would say I I am at my heart and core like a, a... a sort of activist person. Like I'm very opinionated. Um, I have very high conviction about the things I believe in. Um, and I think the connection between that and also, um, you know, being excited about 
the future, right? And being excited about the opportunities and sort of thinking about, okay, where is the world going next? And also like, how do we want to shape it? Mm -hmm. um, and I think that, um, you know, really, uh, really led me into the path of what I'm doing now, both with Boys Club and with FinTech Collective, my mm -hmm. fund. So the, the study of systems of power is an interesting phrase because it's not uh, totally like descript. Like it's very broad, like yes. the study of the systems of power. Uh, and you, I mean, you said it was multidisciplinary, of course, mm -hmm. and it must be. But maybe we could unpack that a little bit more. Like what is a system of power and what does it mean to like study these things? I think power is very multifaceted. There's so many different kinds of power. Some are visible and explicit. Some are invisible. Mm -hmm. um, and I think there's a wide range, right? Like I... I would argue that um, power exists in any situation, um, but I think... In any context. In any context. Mm -hmm. It exists in this conversation. Mm -hmm. It exists in our society. It exists in the way we're going about our day-to-day -day lives. Mm -hmm. um, so just as a small microcosm, I'm the one managing these cameras right now. Exactly. And that is a form of power that I have in this particular context. And so that, right. if that's what you're saying at a very small scale is perhaps what power is. Look, now we're looking at you. Um, but then we can also like, what you're saying is it, it exists in many, many contexts. So, you know, the president of the United States also has power. And mm -hmm. so like critical theory is power at all scales is kind of the idea. I would say that's, so that's the idea. Like that's, that's the framework that it's operating in and focused on, right? Mm -hmm. So everything from like sovereign power to individual power to soft power, social mm -hmm. power, right? Social capital, mm -hmm. um, all of these things are related. And I think, uh, the goal with critical theory is to make or, or to attempt to make, um, invisible mm -hmm. or assumptive forms of power um, more explicit. We need to understand the systems of power that we are operating inside of mm -hmm. in order to be able to essentially break out of them, right? Mm -hmm. Which is where I think crypto comes in. One of my favorite episodes that we've done on Bankless was with Joel Minegro from Placeholder. It was called, uh, I think, Governance and Power. And we were talking about like, why do these governance tokens have value? We were trying to answer mm. that question. What's the association with governance and, and, and price on the secondary market? And he really like destroyed my previous intuition as to what capital was. Like capital, it's like the money that you have in your bank and also the net worth of your combined portfolio. That's what capital is. Mm. And he was like, yes, but also incomplete. There's also social capital, right? Like how much, how much, how many favors do you have stored in the bank with your friends? Like how, how much can you like move the needle of something? And mm -hmm. I think perhaps what you're talking about with, with critical theory is like, okay, if we can figure out how to identify all forms of capital, not just financial capital, not just social capital, political capital, whatever you want and whatever you want it to be, that starts to look something like critical theory. Is that what we're, is that a good definition? I think that's pretty accurate in terms of really getting at this idea of like capital is so much more than um, than is what's obvious. Mm -hmm. um, I do think like these sort of ideologies that critical theory comes from does come with some political mm -hmm. uh, motivations, at least in the major that I was in and in the environment that I was in. Um, but I think like one really interesting learning, right? Like some some people come to me and they're like, how did you start there and get here and do what you're doing now? And I'm like, mm -hmm. I actually see, um, you know, a, kind of a straight line through, right? Like um, I grew up in a family where um, challenging authority was encouraged, which I'm really grateful for. And where um, there was a lot of value placed on not just, oh, what is the answer to the question, but what kinds of questions should we be asking, mm -hmm. right? Like the key is not in the answer, but in the question itself. Mm -hmm. Um, and so I think like um, within critical theory, um, I took a lot of um, what I what I learned and the way that I learned to approach uh, the world um, from a framework perspective. Um, and, you know, after sort of um, exposing myself to many different kinds of people and beliefs that strayed far from my own at the time, um, I was able to really see like, OK, um, you know, there's there's a lot of values um, in crypto 
uh, that I think transcend um, like politics. And I think if, if uh, we're talking about critical theory, which again, I'm still learning what this thing is, we do have to have like a historical perspective as well, uh, because we can't just understand systems of power without seeing how they've like changed and adapted. Uh, and, and again, you've already said that how this is like a very multidisciplinary thing. I would imagine history is one of these things that you must study to understand like critical theory. Um, how, how do you see crypto as like a continuation of this whole thing of, of systems of power? Like and you, you said like, uh, critical theory and crypto is a direct correlation. It's not like a long meandering road. It's actually a direct first critical theory, now crypto. What, what do you see is so direct about this? Crypto is obviously super new and exciting, and it's full of people who are mobilized around um, or united around um, not accepting right the system that we're currently in mm -hmm. and, and being able to imagine a different, better one, right? And so... I think like these modes of of not just accepting kind of what we're told is right or what we're told is the normal thing to do mm -hmm. um, and trying to imagine like a system outside of that um, is really where I see the connection. Although I do see um, within crypto, definitely, you know, I'd say the crypto community departs a lot from some of those ideological roots of critical theory, which I don't necessarily think it's a bad thing. Um, I actually really like um, the the diversity of thought that I've seen within the space so far. Would you, would you say that critical theory doesn't have diversity of thought? Or is that, a, is that an invalid question? Um, that's a loaded question yeah. to ask. <laughs> um, I think within my major, mm -hmm. um, there is no diversity of thought. It was very, very... Uh, liberal and mm -hmm. um woke um yeah. and i definitely still like hold some of the beliefs that i did at the time um but like i said before like i really took the initiative once i started mm -hmm. learning about all these other things like i was never exposed to growing up or in my school right like tech or finance or any of that so mm -hmm. i really just like it was a totally new world for me um, and once I started exploring that, I, I started challenging my own assumptions because I was like, wow, everyone else around me has been saying like tech is bad. Capitalism is mm -hmm. bad. Like all this stuff is bad. So we shouldn't engage. But I was like, no, this this is awesome. Like I was like, you know, when you have a crush and you have like butterflies and like they're all you can think about. Mm -hmm. That's literally how I felt like every single night, like staying up every night, still have like my notes in my notebooks, like just learning a bunch of stuff. Um, but anyways, like. Going through that, I, I also started, you know, realizing like, okay, what things was I sort of taught or not just taught, but expected to believe, mm -hmm. um, within this major, um, and within this institution and school, um, like how much of that actually resonates with me, right? Mm -hmm. And so, um, I mean, we talked a bit, uh, a few weeks ago about thinking for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. Um, and I think for me at the moment, like I, once again, like see we're in a very polarized system and there are some of my beliefs that would fall, um, far on one side and some that would fall far on the other. And I'm comfortable with that. Mm -hmm. Um, and I actually think it's a really good thing that, you know, to be able to, um, not just like loop all of your beliefs or positions on certain issues into one, um, bucket right and to actually try to like discover for yourself like what do I believe and um one one sort of moment in that journey has been um surrounding myself with people across the spectrum mm -hmm. um like I'm friends with many different kinds of people who would fall on both extremes in the middle um and I think we're like kind of losing that as a norm in our society right now mm -hmm. One of the interesting things to me about, about crypto is that um, everyone who understands crypto, there's like a secret handshake that people have. Like, oh, you're a crypto person. I'm also a crypto person. Mm. And like you get to in the same way that like religion played this role way back when where like if you I don't know, I'm, I'm guessing a world that I never lived in 1500s Europe uh, where like maybe you lived in Spain, but then you traveled across to like what is Germany. Again, these countries didn't exist back then, but you get the yes. point. 
but if you're under the same banner of the same religion, you can shake hands with that person. Like, yeah, we're on the same page here. Yeah. And that's yes. what it's like to be a crypto person. It's like, oh yeah, you're, you also uh, are crypto. Like I, we, we know the same stories like, haha, Michael Saylor. Like we have the same like cultural memes. And all of a sudden there's like a connection here about like what values mm-hmm. that we have. Cause they're largely going to be similar, but then they can also diverge. Like, okay, you're a crypto person. Sweet. Like, Federal Reserve, uh, ha, money printing, ha, ha, ha. <laughs> yeah. But also, wait, what, what kind of crypto person are you? Are, like, are you right. a Solana crypto person? Are you right. an NFT crypto person? Are you an Ethereum crypto person? Are you a Bitcoiner? And so like, there's this one part of about crypto where people have broken out of old society. And all the, if you're a crypto person, you have all gone on the same journey as all these other crypto people, which you've broken out of like what is kind of like Plato's cave of society it's like we're no longer in the cave we're kind of woke to the way the machinations of the world works because we're crypto people and then you enter crypto and then like there's a new set of like societies to go into like you have the ethereum societies the solana societies the bitcoining societies and so uh it's always been interesting to me that crypto offers like a new like slate of understanding like a new scaffolding for people to like map on new understanding to and then and then like pick a different route and so like where a lot of people previously might have identified as like a democrat or a republican liberal conservative you get into crypto and people tend to lose a little bit of those older identities and then they pick up new ones Mm. how would you say that this relates to critical theory or or does it at all um Great question. I'd love to take it in a little bit of a different direction, though, because you actually just touched on this massive thesis that I have at the moment. Mm -hmm. Um, So I've been doing a lot of like research into uh, political polarization, Mm -hmm. like studies show Pew, uh, Pew Journal has a lot of great studies on this that I think deserve a lot more attention. Um, Like if you look at the charts, it's kind of insane. Like over the last 10 years, political polarization has skyrocketed. Mm -hmm. Um, Now more people than ever before say they wouldn't be in a relationship or even want to be friends with someone who has a different political Mm -hmm. um, sort of identity as them. At the same time, over the past 10 years, we're seeing religious affiliation in extreme decline. Uh And just like you said, right, like religion and the church is where people used to go to find their community, to find their value system, to find a shared ideology and a shared identity that they like passed along to their children. Right. Um, Now people are losing that. They don't have that anymore. And I think they're turning to um, political parties to find Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And don't get me wrong. I think it's a really good, healthy and positive thing to be politically active and to care about these issues and pay attention to them. Um, Where I think, you know, things uh, might go a little wrong is like when you when when you're in a two party system and America's, um, you know, one of the only countries that does this, it's not working great, um, is those two systems can only work in opposition to one another. Um, Mm. And so I think the question then is like, how do you solve the issues that you're trying to solve if the way you're trying to solve them is always by relying on this othering? Um, And like- just to unpack that a little mm -hmm. bit more, what you're saying is that there are like a larger and larger part of our political system in America is that I'm a Democrat because I need the Republicans to fail. And or vice versa, like I'll be a Republican because like the Democrats can't win. And it's not necessarily like you pick a tribe because of what you believe in. It's that it's what you don't believe in. And so like, can a community exist simply as like being an antithesis to another community? Does it doesn't seem like a very strong foundation for communities to exist upon? It seems like a negative flywheel effect. Yeah, exactly. And what are the consequences of this? Why is this bad? Well, I think I think it prohibits progress. Mm. It sort of sets up the landscape where there's only two buckets, right? Like if I'm um, a Democrat, I believe X, Y, Z about these certain issues. Mm -hmm. If I'm a Republican, I believe X, Y, Z about the same issues. Like it buckets all of your belief systems and like all of your beliefs into one category. But like if you look on an individual level, like humans are so complex, Mm -hmm. right? And they also change over time. And um, I think there should be more room for that. Like how could we, how can we progress as a society if we're not um, 
tolerant of or open to um, being challenged and changing our beliefs. Um, and, you know, we're operating in a very like binary fixed system, I would say. Mm -hmm. um, but I think there should be more room for flexibility and discussion. Um, more diversity of thought. Yeah, more diversity of thought. Exactly. Do you see crypto offering like a platform to solve some of this stuff? Like, how do you see crypto fixing this? Great question. I don't know if crypto fixes it. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's a pretty broad statement to make. But mm -hmm. I will say, um, like I said before, like crypto definitely, crypto is definitely political in certain ways, right? Like I definitely think it attracts libertarian minded people. Mm -hmm. um, but I think it's its emphasis, at least in my experience, has been on values, right? Of like transparency, um, social mobilization, um, like open and open financial system. Um, and all of those things allow us to maybe build c different political communities within that. But by like sharing this already like shared set of values, we're able to accomplish so much more. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think we're at an interesting time in crypto where we're seeing more divisiveness within the community as well. You mean more, more tribalism? I think this is very illuminated after the tornado cash situation mm. of where do where does regulation come into play? Mm. Um, there are people who are strong believers of regulation in crypto and, you know, might say this is the only way we can truly realize crypto's full vision by um, having the right kind of regulation to onboard everyone, including enterprise institutions. And another that might argue, no, like the the full vision of crypto being realized means that there's no regulation. So at least in my, in the sort of communities and spheres I'm in, that's more of the um, divisiveness I've seen, mm -hmm. um, which I think is interesting. Yeah. So that, that debate is one part, like there are some Ethereum developers who are, who will like refuse to work on a client that supports censorship at the base level, layer, right? Which is kind of where this tornado cash conversation has really gone. Um, cause that's where the, like the logical conclusion is, right? If we want to like have these things be like regulatory friendly, we kind of need to bake in certain rules at the base layer, but that just turns off basically every one of the developers that came here in the, in, for the, you know, in the first place. Right. And then there's newer parts of crypto that are like, well, if we want like Ethereum and Bitcoin to scale out to the whole entire world, we're gonna have to play nice with the previous power structures that exist. Uh, we need to like interoperate with old rules rather than like conflict with them and so i think maybe what you're saying is that there's like this these uh, a divide growing in the crypto space where like some people are like we should sacrifice something to get adoption and then there's like the hard line of libertarians who are like we'll sacrifice nothing uh and we'll just have whatever we have at, at the at the end of this and this this seems to be like a deeper deeper issue than just like i'm a solana person i'm an ethereum person i'm a bitcoin person this is getting down to like the very basement level of crypto. I agree. I think it's way deeper than just, you know, um, kind of like what sector of crypto are you into or, or mm. supporting, but um, it is like a very fundamental question that quite directly affects the future of the space. Mm -hmm. um, and I think a big question becomes like, you know, <laughs> what this is really calling into question is like, what are the fundamental values of crypto and of the people engaging in this system, right? Like, do, what does it mean for to realize crypto's full potential? Is it onboarding everyone and sort of being flexible about the framework or approach or form in which that takes? Or is it like sticking true to what I would say is the initial vision? Um, and yeah, like being hard about that and like mm -hmm. refusing to engage in anything else. I think that question, what are our values, is probably a, qu a question that's relevant to any system of power uh, that throughout time. And, and so it's, all, it's like, as so long as there's a community, there's probably always this question. Do, do you have any thoughts about to like how that question in particular has permeated throughout all systems of power and throughout history? Or what? Yeah, role does I that mean, what play? comes up for me there, and I'm literally just like riffing here, but what comes up for me there is like, not just what are our values, but like how are our values expressed mm. and like what does it mean within the in-group to comply to those values, mm. um, right? So like we could say like like this thing is the value, um, 
But I think more and more we've gotten into these sort of prescriptive modes of thinking of like, if you're not doing this thing, if you're not doing that thing, it means that you don't Mm. agree or sort of like comply almost Mm. to this value. You're not in the tribe. Right. So like, I think, I think maybe a more complex question than just like, what are our values is like, how does the socially acceptable way to engage within a value system or to show support of a value, like change over time. Um, and I think it obviously changes a lot depending Mm -hmm. on the context. Mm -hmm. Um, like we've seen it change a lot in the past five to 10 years, right? Like with the rise of like Instagram infographics, I would Mm -hmm. say like, um, I've been thinking a lot about actually like Instagram infographics and I think there's like a social pressure to post them when, you know, there's one issue to the next, right? But um, there's a lot of like, you know, I wonder sometimes like when people are posting these infographics on their story, is it more for like a signaling effect or more to not be... Can you define be... what, a, what an Instagram infographic is? Yes, quick? yes. Yeah. An Instagram infographic, I would say it's like a really pretty nice like graphic design Canva mm-hmm. like poster um, explaining facts about an issue or like stating an assertion um, or position on an issue and explaining why the viewer should believe in it. Um, so it's like narrative work, propaganda work, propaganda, not in a negative sense, but also uh, perhaps negative. Yes. Yeah. Like quite literally. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, and like, it's so like I'll see people like post an infographic and I used to be an infographic poster yeah. myself, yeah. I will say. Um, <laughs> But I'm like, okay, like, you know, that's great and all, but is that more to feel like, oh, I'm doing the right thing or like, Mm -hmm. oh, I want other people to see me supporting this issue or being on this side, Mm -hmm. especially in the climate that we're in versus like, do you actually like care? Are you actually like deeply thinking about these issues and like talking about them Mm -hmm. within your day to day life? Are you virtue signaling or do you actually believe what you're posting? Is that yeah, yeah. and I think it's gotten way easier, way more easy to uh, virtue signal than ever and also to not even realize you're doing it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, I think that, that brings up the question of like as going back to like, uh, you know, critical theory and, and organizations of people throughout time that create systems of power how these people, how these communities spread information and, and define. And this is why I asked that question, like, what are our values? How do, like, it's great when a community can ask ourselves those questions. And I think crypto in its very beginning stages actually has like the privilege of not being so large that only a few people have to ask that question for that kind of to become the conversation at the time. Yeah. Like during this tornado cash um, uh, era, it was Eric Wall that put out that post on that that poll on Twitter saying, hey, Ethereum community, would you ever support censorship at the base layer? And that one tweet was like this one opportunity for this whole entire Ethereum community to rally behind and say, no, we'll never support it. Never, ever, ever. And that was like like a unique opportunity that we have as a crypto community. It's like we have crypto Twitter. We also had this one tweet to focus on where we got to define our values in that one particular moment. But I would imagine throughout history, there's been like less, more loose ways, less concrete ways, less specific ways for communities to actually figure out what they value. And now we're like in the, going to the political spectrum, we have like the Democratic and Republican uh, like national parties, which kind of like define the values a little bit. They are they just des- they decide who's on the team and who's not. Uh, and so that's like a system of power that's largely out of the hands of people. Uh, but overall, like there's also like so many other different like organizations throughout history, like every single revolution ever. How did they define mm-hmm. like what? they cared about and why were they revolting in the first place and who was able to like lead that conversation have you ever how do you think about this as it relates to the crypto space like dissemination and acceptance of like narrative while there's also like we know there's twitter bots out there trying to pump bags and so like that's out there like an influence like how how do you think about this in the crypto space well bot networks are on the rise yeah um but yeah i think uh, it's it's interesting i mean One thing I'll say is like you said a little earlier that the sort of Democratic and Republican Party are sort of setting different values, right, and defining them. Um, I think like from a very high level external 
point of view that's true. But one interesting thing that I've been noticing recently in developing all these friendships with many different kinds of people with many different political beliefs is like we actually share the same values. Mm -hmm. Like we share the same values of honesty and authenticity and being a good friend and family building um, and transparency. Um, but the way that we think is the best to go about the way of like realizing and achieving those values in our day-to-day -day lives in society might actually be really different. Um, so which the is theory where, is the same, but the execution's the different, the debate. Yes. Like I actually met someone at, um, where was it? Like East Denver or somewhere recently at a conference. And we were talking like really vibing and we were talking about like taxes and how we think that should go. And we were like super aligned. And I was thinking, oh, it's probably, this person's probably like super aligned with where I see myself or feel myself sit at the moment on the political spectrum. Mm -hmm. Turns out opposite. Hmm. And once that was uncovered, like they had a totally different attitude towards me. Like, Interesting. and that really like took me back and I was like, hey, like, don't you think this is kind of funny though? Like, I, I think it's cool. Like we have the same values. We just think we should go about them or mm -hmm. maybe construct the framework around them in different ways. Um, and I think like that defensiveness is natural. And like, I, I definitely used to be like that, like very much. Mm -hmm. um, but I actually think like there's a lot of alpha in <laughs> finding people with the same values as you that have really different beliefs on the outside um, or, or beliefs of ways of, to go about realizing them and like talking more about that. And mm -hmm. so within crypto, that's like, one thing that I see as opportunity is like rather than um, starting with like more of an external perception of like, you know, political motivations or parties, we're starting with the values. Mm. Um, and then there's like different kind of factions that right. and and I think you see this also like within crypto, like it's really interesting because across the different communities, you see it in really different ways, like Dao people like very like hippie kind yeah, of like uh -huh. communism vibes yes, like yeah. in in like the most like affectionate way possible because obviously i'm into that but like then like there's other parts that are like very libertarian very mm -hmm. like you know no government interference um but like we're all united by the same value system i'd say at least like for the most fundamental ones mm -hmm. so it's, i think it's really interesting and i think it's like a great opportunity to sort of rethink the way that we talk about these things and think about these things and like identify ourselves with these things. It definitely has been one of my uh, most interesting experiences moving to New York is like in, in Manhattan, you have like the trading firms and you have all the traders out there in, in Manhattan. Yeah. And then here in Williamsburg, there's like a lot of Dow people, which are like, like the Burning Man yes, types, yes. right? Oh yeah. My God, yeah. Yeah. And then there's like, there's also the DeFi people in Soho uh, with like OpenSea and Uniswap and DYDX. And then you got like the NFT people out well, wherever they exist. Times Square. Yeah, sure. Yeah. In Times Square. <laughs> yeah. And like, and, but then also like LA has got a bunch of like NFT people. And like, you're right, these find these people all, all kind of have a particular vibe about them. Yeah. Like they're all, they all find each other. Right. The, um, and, but then also like you, you were saying, we were talking about how like, um, there's the same, the same fundamental philosophy, same belief structures, but then different ways to like go about that. And that's, that's been my, like my biggest, uh, idea is to like the difference between Bitcoin and Ethereum. We have the same values, even though the Bitcoiners will never admit it about Ethereum people. We believe in the same things. We just one one group of people says, yes, and Bitcoin is how you express this. And then the Ethereum people is like, no, Ethereum is how you express this. But it all collapses down to like the same values at the end of the day, which is kind of like what I was going back to earlier. Like previously, before crypto, people had like these alignments like liberal conservative republican democrat and then you go through like this filter of crypto and if if you can make it through the other side of crypto you kind of lose your old identities and then you like latch on to new ones like instead of republican democrats you we need to do like a study on this we need to yeah. do like a quantitative study on like what, would that what look like? Well, I think it could be, I mean, well, here's the thing is like, it would not be super accurate because self-reporting and self-surveys yeah. are not accurate. But for a starting point, we could do like, um, sort of how, how did you, or how, you know, before you got into crypto, what would you say is your primary political mm -hmm. association? And like after, where would you fall mm -hmm. on this scale? I think that'd be super interesting. Did your um, political affiliation like change or political demeanor change uh, when you after going through the filter of crypto? 
It did, but I don't even know if it was just crypto, honestly. Mm -hmm. Like I, I made it a really big initiative in my life to really do everything I could to make my own opinions on things. So mm -hmm. like for like every morning, for example, like I read um, far right news sources. I read far left news sources. I read like what I would try to find or say are like the most moderate news sources. Um, so I try to read like about the same stories and the same events that are happening through many different lenses because um, everything is biased these days, right? right. Like, and, um, and again, like this is something I really like realized and noticed too after like leaving the, the kind of like liberal arts bubble I was in, which by the way, like I don't know how familiar you are with that scene, but if if your also beliefs liberal art school, yeah. okay yeah. yeah so like i don't know if at the time though for you like it might have been different because like i'm younger than you but like in my experience it was like if you don't believe these things you are literally ostracized from mm. the community like mm -hmm. ostracized cancel culture oh like big time cancel culture was the culture <laughs> oh no <laughs> like yeah no seriously um and when you're surrounded by that for so long like it just you know it's group think. Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I don't want to be in that. Even in crypto, like mm -hmm. there's group thing in crypto. So I just think it's like important to expose yourself to many, mm -hmm. like diverse information diet, healthiest diet out there. Yeah. Um, super important. And like, that's also for me how I found like new interests as well. Arbitrum One is pioneering the world of secure Ethereum scalability and is continuing to accelerate the Web3 landscape. Hundreds of projects have already deployed on Arbitrum One, producing flourishing DeFi and NFT ecosystems. With the recent addition of Arbitrum Nova, gaming and social dApps like Reddit are also now calling Arbitrum home. Both Arbitrum One and Nova leverage the security and decentralization of Ethereum and provide a builder experience that's intuitive, familiar, and fully EVM compatible. On Arbitrum, both builders and users will experience faster transaction speeds with significantly lower gas fees. With Arbitrum's recent migration to Arbitrum Nitro, it's also now 10 times faster than before. Visit Arbitrum.io where you can join the community, dive into the developer docs, bridge your assets, and start building your first dApp. With Arbitrum, experience Web3 development the way it was meant to be. Secure, fast, cheap, and friction-free. The Layer 2 era is upon us. Ethereum's Layer 2 ecosystem is growing every day, and we need Layer 2 bridges to be fast and efficient in order to live a Layer 2 life. Across is the fastest, cheapest, and most secure cross-chain bridge. With Across, you don't have to worry about high fees or long wait times. Assets are bridged and available for use almost instantaneously. Across's bridges are powered by UMA's optimistic oracle to securely transfer tokens between Layer 2s and Ethereum. Across is critical ecosystem infrastructure, and Across V2 has just launched. Their new version focuses on higher capital efficiency, layer two to layer two transfers, and a brand new chain with Polygon, all while prioritizing high security and low fees. You can be a part of Across's story by joining their Discord and using Across for all of your layer two transferring needs. So go to across.to to quickly and securely bridge your assets between Ethereum, Optimism, Polygon, Arbitrum, or Boba networks. The Brave Wallet is your secure multi-chain on-ramp into Web3, and it's built directly into the Brave privacy browser. Gone are the days of managing multiple wallet extensions that put you at risk of phishing, spoofs, and tracking. With the Brave Wallet, you can securely manage your crypto assets across more than 100 different chains, including Ethereum, Layer 2s, Solana, and more, all without downloading risky extensions. The Brave Wallet is easy to set up and removes the headache of jumping between wallets and extensions. It's lightweight, but packed with great features like built-in token swaps, buying and holding NFTs with a gallery view, and support for hardware wallets. But also much more than that, because Brave is shipping new features every single month with a mission to make Web3 easier to navigate for its over 55 million users. Wallet extensions are a thing of the past. So get started with Brave's Web3 Ready Browser today and experience a decentralized web seamlessly without all the clutter. You can download the browser at brave.com slash bankless and click the wallet icon to get started. One of the uh, things that uh, I've been thinking about lately, and while, while I was writing out the notes for the show, I, I had an inspiration for a tweet and I tweeted out, smart contracts democratize the ability democratize the access to writing the rules. Uh, and this is something, this is an idea that like Ray Dalio put into my head a while ago where he was like, yeah, like different empires come and go and sometimes empires clash. And when they clash, it's really just a fight over who's going to write the rules. Like, so when one empire wins, they subjugate the loser empire to their rules. 
Uh, it's like we it's our laws that are canon, not yours. And if like they don't agree on laws, then they have like war. And it's usually an economic war. And this is what I see kind of happening with like Republicans and Democrats is like, all right, we have the Republican Party and then the Democrat Party. And these are just like trading blows as to who gets to write the rules for the next four years. And we're going into crypto and we ha we have the ability for people to like, you know, write smart contracts. These are like, mm -hmm. you can democratize access to writing the rules. We also have like, now we have DAOs, we have NFT projects, we have DeFi apps, and all we have communities that are around these things. And so like mm -hmm. now each one of these communities kind of gets to write the rules. Now it's not at the same scale of an empire or a nation state, but it's still pushing the ability to create power structures, like create rules mm -hmm. to the hands of the communities. And so when we talk about like this idea of like changing power structures and changing like uh, changing like orientations of people's alignments, whether it's like a, a political alignment or just like an ideology alignment, how do you think that this changes the way that society will work when like all of a sudden we have many, many, many more cultures that are outside of just like the political spectrum and now inside of crypto communities and they all get to write rules? Like what, what do you think are the consequences of this? Well, dude, I think it's, I think it's so exciting. Crypto economies are introducing like fundamentally novel and innovative ways of doing governance in human life mm -hmm. that we have never seen before. And the design space is so open. It's it's crazy. And I think few few realize this. Like like crypto economies, like we have now dynamic voting in almost real time. We have mm. Um, voting systems and governance mechanisms that are completely unconventional um, to how traditional corporations and institutions work. Um, and like I said before, like the design space is so open. Like I think recently in recent months, we've seen a lot of criticism of DAOs and DAO governance. And at least on my timeline, like I've been seeing a lot of tweets on, you know, DAOs as a business model, never going to work. Like this is never going to work. All of these like DAOs are failing. Um, and I'm like, okay, but what's the common thread for the DAOs that are failing? It's, I would say most of them are using token based voting governance, right? Um, I am so excited about the design space that exists to create more dynamic forms of governance mechanisms. Like I think, um, humans are, humans are dynamic. Humans are complex. Like our beliefs, as even talking about in this conversation, our belief systems change over time. We get new information, um, to contextualize, right? And, um, I think number one, uh, fixed voting and like in a snapshot period of time, um, I don't think is the most optimal way to go about voting. Like I'm really excited about um, this, this sort of novel governance mechanism called conviction voting where basically you like stake your vote and every day or whatever time metric you can set ideally, um, it gains more power. Mm. And then you can retract it rather than like I vote today and in two years, maybe I wish I hadn't done that but there's nothing I can do to change it. But I also think like we shouldn't be, um, we shouldn't be putting decision making power or privileging decision making power um, for people that just have the financial means to do so. Right. And like when you do that, you get like a very, I would say over time, like a very corrupt system where um, there's this sort of uh, tragedy of the commons where like, people like the general population of voters within the system knows that their their vote won't really make a difference so they get voting fatigue they don't participate um, and then you have like one two three maybe four major actors controlling everything um, oftentimes in a way that is not reflective of what the general majority wants um, mm -hmm. so I think there's like an urgent call to action here to uh, put a lot more research, documentation and experimentation into our DAO governance mechanisms. Like I think, yes, we are seeing DAOs fail and that is such a good thing. Hmm. How could we ever progress right. if we don't have that point? And like, what can we learn from this? And what are the patterns? Um, we were talking about this before. We were talking about investing and like mm -hmm. how we're um, huge, like, pattern identification people mm, pattern recognition yes yeah. mm. pattern recognizers <laughs> um but same thing we should be doing that now we should mm -hmm. be applying that now we should like have more initiatives for um 
like peer reviewed research journals to study these different DAOs and their governance and voting mechanisms as case studies and come out with reports. And there actually is a lot of this. If you look on like JSTOR, um, there's so many good peer reviewed journals on DAO governance and really? protocol. Yes. Uh, I'll send you some after this, like with my <laughs> annotations. There's, there's so many good ones and they have realized crazy things. Like <laughs> I will read these and I go back to like the voice club team. Like, guys, we, we, I'm like so fired up and I'm just like, no one fucking like gets what I'm, I, I sound crazy, but, um, it sound animated. It sounds energetic. Yeah. Yeah. It's yeah. Clearly, I mean, it's exciting. Tapped into something it's here. so exciting. Like, mm -hmm. um, for example, I think I may have told you about this study, but, um, there was a, uh, uh, there was a study that basically used all of these decentralized um, in-person resistance movements over time, right? So like Occupy Wall Street was one, um, the Zapatas movement was one, and they basically like studied, you know, what made these uh, communities and organizations um, disseminate over time. Like what led to their ultimate unsustainability? Right. Why'd they fail? Right. Why did they fail? And like, um, one thing that they found was uh, in the proposal process, like when there, when someone made a proposal, it was re rejected and there was no follow up. People didn't feel heard. And so they ended up like leaving the organization. Right. They didn't get feedback or an explanation on why. And like this is something that like in the sort of like code is law, like protocol is law, I guess, like mindset or ideology, I think we really fail to recognize. Right. Like I and I think we also failed to underestimate the um, the salience of governance that it is done off chain mm. um, in a in a more like concealed way, like private calls, personal relationships, right. um, soft power. Right. Like right. all that does affect the way people vote right. in governance. Only some governance is actually done on chain. Yeah. Yeah. It's and like, like the, it's like that iceberg meme where like. The on-chain governance is just like the tip of the iceberg. It's just the part that's expressed. Totally. And like last night we were talking with Leighton and like we were talking about delegation and delegating tokens. And like I, like I said, I'm I'm for delegated governance. But I also think like how do you account for these very um, significant variables within that, right? Like someone literally just being more socially popular, right? And like wanting to appease to them. Like that is human nature. Mm -hmm. And um, without anonymous voting, like, I think we we do see a lot of that today. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I think there's like, I'm excited. I think there's a lot of design space that we still have left to conquer. I think it's, I, I super resonate with the idea that one, so many decentralized movements fail or dwindle or just dissolve because a lot of their energy of their community members dissipates when their community members try and exhibit some change, express some change upon the movement. That change doesn't work and they don't know why or they don't know how it didn't work or they don't know and they don't really have any next steps or like they don't have any lessons to be learned. They don't feel heard. And there's like this part of the human brain, the human condition is like people kind of just want to be heard. Like they, they want they want their existence acknowledged, right? We all have goals. When when things get in the way of our goals, that gives us negative emotions. And and we if we want to ad align with something and be a part of something, we need positive emotions. We're gonna we're gonna move away from the things that make us feel bad. We're gonna go to the things that make us feel positive. And if we are have these goals that we want to express onto these political movements, which people generally like really feel strongly about, but we don't feel heard, we're gonna go do something else. Uh, and so the, when, when you tell me that the decentralized movements fail because people can't f feel heard, my mind goes back to this like uh, idea that we were talking about earlier of different forms of capital. There's financial yeah. capital, which is token votes, which we kind of know are like, you know, new and not complete. Yeah. There's like social capital, which what we were talking about, well, kind of po popularity contests. Well, you know, sometimes that popularity context is Vitalik Buterin and his really good idea about how something should work on Ethereum and maybe we should listen to that. Sometimes it's actually just like, a, a, you know, malicious. I could go both ways. But I think what, what I'm hearing you're saying is that there are these DAOs that are trying to figure out different ways of enabling their community members to express what they want to see changed in their DAO that doesn't necessarily restrict down to how many tokens do you have or like how popular is your profile picture handle inside of Discord? How can we enable these community members to express themselves without that being like gameable or attackable or like fall apart because of like a poor mechanism design? Mm -hmm. And this seems to be also like 
kind of close to the metal of what critical theory is. If I'm, if I'm trying, I'm still trying to learn what that is. Uh, Aren't we all? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's kind of the point. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on, on that whole uh, ramble? Yeah. Well, that definitely resonates. I think humans just want to see and be seen. Mm -hmm. um, that may or may not be what it means to like love someone. Mm. Um, if we want to go that deep. Mm -hmm. But I think oh, like... I'm happy to because I, <laughs> I wrote a little bit about that. In oh, you did? Once. Yeah. Oh uh -huh. my God. Tell me more. Tell yeah. Me so more. The, the idea was that... Um, all of these new DAOs, I think this was in the middle of a NFT summer, um, uh, but also DAO, also DAO summer is that like all of these DAOs now compete for our love mm -hmm. where like uh, the, the centralized fixed concrete algorithms of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram are like trying to compete to make us angry because that's the one algorithm. It's like it's the rage algorithm. Um, DAOs now and like all of these social organizations on Ethereum, which there are many. NFT projects, DAOs, sometimes sometimes even DeFi apps, they're now trying to compete for your love. Uh, and so uh, it's like the, it's these protocols that enable their community members the most are the ones that are going to find the most alignment and are going to find the people that not sell their token and show up in that discord because that community feels the most loved. And this also, I think, fits into the meta around like Gone are their days of Bitcoin as the static asset and CryptoPunks as the static NFTs. All future NFTs are likely going to be productive, as in they're going to have a team or organization that like makes that NFT useful. And what is that? What does useful even mean if not just like making that owner feel special and warm and fuzzy and like alignment and having loyalty with their assets? Yeah. And if if owning these assets opens particular doors in DAOs, whether that's governance changes or just like perks, uh, whatever, so long as like the community member feels heard in a community that they share values in, that community should do well. So yeah. that's, that's kind of where I was going with that. That that really resonates. And I think um, like NFTs aside, I think we we can see this a lot um, with Web2 examples of when people are starting communities and DAOs. I'm like, it's really, really important to be as specific as possible. Mm -hmm. um, and like, don't be afraid to be niche. Like, what are the strongest subreddits? Like the weirdest stuff that you've ever seen mm -hmm. <laughs> that is like so niche and weird, right? Like mm -hmm. those are the strongest communities because they're really united around something specific and they they know why they're there mm -hmm. and they really feel a shared, whether it's a value system or interest or whatever, common problem. When you're starting a community, like a lot of community um, communities that I see like starting up, like they're like, okay, how do we like appeal to this group, this group? I'm like, no, just focus on one thing. That's how you're really going to attract intrinsically motivated participants, like you're saying. Mm -hmm. um, if you're very intentional about who this community is for and like who it's for not, who it's not for. And then like from there, like you're saying, I think there's this huge component as well of like A, giving... Um, giving community members the resources that they need to understand how to uh, how to interact with the community and like what opportunities exist, right? So, um, you know, where do I go for this for this question? Or, um, you know, what are what are ways I can meet others in the community, whatever it is, um, but really like context setting. I made a meme about this, but um, it's really important to set context so people feel a sense of familiarity and feel equipped with like the knowledge they need to thrive in the community. And then from there, I think like this also circles back to an earlier point in our conversation about um, creating an environment for diversity of thought and opinion. Mm. Um, and I think sometimes that just means like opening, really opening the conversation up and and being willing to engage with the others that have different beliefs than you. And like, I sort of talked to you a bit about this before, um, but, you know, it, I think within Boys Club, um, and I'll speak like from my own personal perspective as Parker, like, I think we've been very intentional about creating a space um, where our our values are clear, um, like our mission is clear, our vibe is clear, um, but we're also not telling people what to think or mm -hmm. what to believe, right? And we're saying, here's what we here's the kind of culture um, that we want to see in crypto and Web3 and that we want to drive, like join us, mm -hmm. right? And then those who resonate with that can join. But I think we 
we've been really intentional about, um, and even with, you know, some external pressure, like not putting a statement out, for example, that we're not sure resonates with all of our members, mm -hmm. um, just cause like people from the outside might assume it does. Yeah. Sure. Sure. Um, one, one of the same like thoughts that I came, that came out of that, that same like DeFi summer, NFT summer is that, uh, th and this came after uh, Blau's platform Royal, where he had this tokenized music, uh, platform and the idea of like a tokenized piece of art. And, but this also works with the DAO community too, where, uh, the crowd, the token owning crowd now also has a voice. Uh, and so like, say you, you have the performer, right? The, cr the value creator, and this could be Blau, the DJ. This could also be like bo the boys club, uh, core team, whoever is like, there's always like two sides of an organization, right? Like there is no such thing as an artist without the consumers. Right. And so there's always been like a two way conversation between artists and their fans. Uh, and you know, the artist will do something that the fans like, and then, then the crowd goes wild, right? But now we have tokens. And so like now when the artist does something that the crowd likes, the token goes up in price or the token just becomes more useful or something. And it, it gives like a back and forth conversation when there's a way for this community to express themselves back to the leadership or, and sometimes that leadership is just like the DAO governance, which is themselves. They are their own leadership. Uh, but when the community has a voice, there can be kind of this two way narrative, this two way conversation as to like, okay, what do we want this to become? Whether like, whether it's Blau, the DJ saying like, all right, what kind of music do you guys want? And like that, the community can actually like be given the driver's seat a mm -hmm. little bit. Yeah. And again, going back to like smart contracts actually give communities the power to write the rules. And we have tokens allow the, com the communities to have voice and control and influence. And all of a sudden, like writing the rules is something. And, and again, like tokens, and maybe we're still stuck in the age of like snapshot token votes, but like we're trying to get out of that, out of the dark ages. Uh, maybe that's what we'll call it when we look back on it. But all of a sudden, like the communities are able to like kind of write the laws and and express themselves and their values to each other and and themselves. Yeah. And all of a sudden we get to like it feels like we get to steer something that we weren't able to steer before. Totally. How, how do you think about this? OK, so I'll relate this back to actually a course I took Um within the critical theory major, mm -hmm. which is called resistance movements in the law. We basically studied a bunch of resistance movements mm -hmm. um, and then compared them to legal kind of case studies. Um, and we're ultimately trying to answer this question of, does culture shape the law or does law shape culture? And one Ooh, really- Repeat that question again, because that's hot. Uh, does culture shape the law or does law shape culture? Love it. I would say they're a cycle of mutual constitution. Of course. Um, but there was a really interesting study that's always resonated with me and it just keeps coming up in my work in Dallas. Mm -hmm. um, and basically it showed like there are these types of community kind of lawyers or policymakers that um, often do a bunch of professional institutional research, market research, you know, you know, the whole thing, like, and then make policy recommendations. Um, but ultimately... Um, in the follow-up with those communities, usually the policies like five years later were not actually found to have much impact or actually fix the problems that the community was facing. But the lawyers that actually went into those communities and spent like significant amounts of time, like weeks and months with individual community members, talking to them, listening, um, really trying to understand like what are your daily problems and like how do you think that we should solve these? Like, yes, I'm the expert, but like how do you, how do you see this, you know, being solved for? Um, or what would you like support and help in? And the lawyers who spent that extra time actually embedded within the community um, came out with policy recommendations and changes and outcomes that five years down the line were significantly more successful um, in solving that community's problems and in improving the day-to-day um, -day life of those communities than the ones that made like external recommendations. And I think I think about this a lot within DAOs and like it relates to what you're saying in the sense that DAOs are almost like from the get-go, right? Like expected to think of the community. Mm -hmm. And we see this in when there's a treasury that doesn't have a lot of community allocation that's like not a good luck, right? right? Like right. there's this new expectation from the get-go that I think DAOs present of 
listening to the community and getting their involvement and participation that I haven't seen really exist anywhere else before. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think that's really interesting. Um, and like you're saying, like tokens are like a mechanism and vehicle at enabling that. But I also think like synchronous communication, going back to the sort of proposal drop off follow up thing is really important. Like one thing that we, um, recently integrated into like our proposal process in voice club is a zoom call like if you're making a proposal you have to hold a zoom call and if everyone can't attend like that's okay but you have to hold a zoom call to like pitch your idea and just like get others feedback before the voting goes live and like we used to do a system where it was just um posting a proposal having a async discussion um, and then going into voting, but we realized like the Zoom call is actually like very, very important. Hmm. Um, and uh, what did the Zoom call bring to the table that without it wouldn't the boys club wouldn't have? It's a great question. I think like more openness and fluidity to the discussion and like a different level of just humanness that mm -hmm. you can't get through chatting on Discord. Um and also like the ability to explore different ideas or different opinions in real time with people that you care about and that you have, that you share skin in the game with mm -hmm. on the same thing. Mm -hmm. um, and like, I, I know Dina and Natasha kind of talked about this like when they were on the pod recently, but um, one thing that really struck me when I started working with them, which is about a year ago when Boys Club started in November of last year, um, was I was like, whoa, they are so honest about how they're feeling. Like, they're like, I'm really nervous about this. I'm I'm feeling like worried about this or doubtful about this or ha feeling insecurity around this thing. And I was like, wow. Because like, personally, I was coming from before a mindset of like, okay, I of course am feeling those things in my day-to-day -day life and like work sometimes, but I'm not going to share them. <laughs> I'm not going to like, sh like, you know, um, you know, like the meme where it's like the guy and he's like, I made it up. Like, I'm not right. going to, like, tell everyone I made it up, obviously. Yeah. But, like, then working with them, like, oh, yeah, I'm just going to tell everyone, like, how I'm really feeling. And, like, it, it builds this level of, like, trust and honesty where mm -hmm. also where we're able to, like, like hear that and, like, hear someone say, oh, I'm feeling, like, nervous about this or insecure about this and be like, oh, like, you shouldn't be. Like, you're good. And, like, that can actually, like, really make a difference in the morale. Mm -hmm. um, so that was sort of a long-winded, like, thought there. But, um that being said, like, I think, yeah, fostering that level of like vulnerability within your community combined with encouraging diversity of thought and then creating like operational and logistic systems that enable that, um, I think really will work to produce um, what you're saying, like this sort of shared ownership and decision making and discussion. Mm -hmm. Have you ever thought about how um, th what crypto is supplying to the world with what, what we're talking about. They, they, there's different ways to express yourself. There's different like factions to align with, like whether you want to join Boys Club or like Pleaser DAO, like Pick Your DAO, Bankless DAO, Pick Your DAO. There's so many different ways to like have your values be expressed by the DAO landscape. And that's kind of like my bull case for DAOs is like, there's a DAO out for you. It's kind of like, you know, yeah. you're going, you're going into college and like, all right, pick your club. Like there's a yeah. club, there's a DAO for you somewhere. Yeah. And so you can find your tribe. Uh, if there's not one, then maybe you should make one because maybe other people are looking to find like resonance. Have you thought about how the, and this is what I, I mean when I say cri what crypto is supplying to the world, that we're supplying all of these places for people to like perhaps feel resonance with. Have you thought about how this kind of relates to what is lacking in the outside crypto world where we have like millennials and zoomers who for the feel are the first generations to feel less empowered than their parents and they don't feel like the boomers listen to them in society. Have you thought about how crypto like actually solves or not necessarily solves, but just like answers to some of the, the growing voids that are in society these days? I think with like DAOs and the governance spectrum and design space that exists today, like what I, what my initial thought is what immediately comes to mind is just like, more effective means of grassroots organizations mm -hmm. achieving their goals and also building their own cultural cultures and identities. Like while I am not the biggest fan of token voting, like that is probably a great system for some DAOs. And like, that's great. Like, I don't think we should be going around saying like, all DAOs should do this, all DAOs should do that. Like, like you're saying, it's very customizable across the stack. Um, and I think what that means is like for 
maybe the first time ever in history with these innovative and novel forms of governance and forms of organization, um, different organizations specifically can um, more quickly mobilize around a common goal um, or a common value and achieve that. Like we saw that mm. with Ukraine DAO. Um, we saw that almost with Constitution DAO. Like Ukraine DAO raised more money in the first week of it being formed than the UN did for humanitarian relief in Ukraine. Mm. Like actually conceptualize that. Like that's fucking crazy. Can yeah. I curse on here? Yeah, totally. That's fucking crazy. 100%. Like it's insane. And like, that's so cool. And I think that really goes to show like, um, I'm also getting really into this idea of like flash DAOs and like, when does the DAO disseminate? Like probably like not all DAOs should strive to or be expected to exist forever. Right. Um, so I think yeah, we're really- The goal really... is to not have Ukraine DAO. What? The goal is to not have Ukraine yes, DAO. Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, and the goal is to like create a spectrum of ways to organize mobilization and governance in a way that enables different DAOs with different objectives and working in different timelines across different scales to quickly and effectively achieve their goals. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's like super cool because like if you think about it, it's the way I kind of like envision it, it's like all of these different like factions, like you said mm -hmm. before, like you also use that word working outside of the system. But I think within DAOs too, we're reaching a lot of weird questions, like big hairy questions of okay. like, like I've been reading um, this book, uh, Rethinking, Reimagining Organizations, that talks about like this teal, teal model. Um, and it's very similar to what we've been doing within Boys Club and like what also kind of what Orchid Out does with like different guilds or pods that each have their own sort of mini DAOs inside of them um working together to form one DAO but like basically the whole thesis of the book and the teal practice um is borrowed from like corporate structures mm -hmm. so like almost in the same way that we're reaching this circle within the wider crypto community of like okay does crypto just become sort of like a token economic system and like blockchain that the government is like running on um, like DAOs now are sort of reaching this point, I think, where it's like, oh, like our DAOs just like basically like now adopting corporate structures. Right. I don't think it's like necessarily good or bad. And but I think it's like interesting that we're seeing this like full circle thing. And I wonder like what the sort of, I guess, like peaks and valleys of different like lifelines within the evolution of this will be. Mm -hmm. Oh, one other thing that I've been thinking about um, is I was thinking a lot about I've been thinking a lot about like parenting like I'm really excited to be a parent one day um and so like I think a lot about like oh like how do I want my kids to do this or that and I was thinking like hmm it seems like a lot of parenting might actually just be about like fostering intrinsic motivation and creating like positive feedback loop incentive mechanisms for your kids and then I was sort of thinking like can you unpack that a little bit why why is that um <laughs> Well, I think it's like, I think intrinsic motivation is really important, right? Mm -hmm. Like, um, at least for me personally, I, I was raised without a lot of pressure. Like my parents were never like, oh, we want you to be successful in this way, or we want you to go down this track or do this thing, um, or go to this school, like, or get married. Like those were never conversations, but the conversations are more like, this is the type of person that we want you to be like, hmm. um, like a kind person and it was a little more meta more values based yeah. i would mm. say than like more values based than um than like outcome based mm -hmm. or like label based um and so i think like by starting with the values like that foster a lot of intrinsic motivation just in how i interact in the day-to-day -day world um and i also think like by fostering intrinsic motivation um you're also by proxy encouraging a lot of curiosity and like you're mm -hmm. encouraging your children or whoever to like, awesome, like get so excited about this, go explore it, go figure it out, go try this thing, go fail. Um, and then the like incentive mechanism thing, I mean, that's like everything from like <laughs> brushing your teeth to like going to school and like just, all, you know, all these things. Um, but I was thinking about how there's a lot of like relation between maybe how DAOs talk about, you know, 
getting contributors involved in fostering that kind of ownership and like with parenting, I don't know yet, but um, I was sort of thinking about like this next generation of like Dao parents and like, what will mm-hmm. they be like? So you're, you're saying that you can kind of apply the the idea of how to be a good parent to also a Dao and say, hey, if we can get this like smaller part of the Dao to start like creating a feedback loop inside of itself, then that little part of the DAO can like self perpetuate and we don't have to think about that anymore. And now that's a cell, like an auto functioning part of the DAO. And then we can like create this over and over and over again for many, many parts of the other parts of the DAO. And if we can do that enough times, like all of a sudden the DAO as a whole is like the self perpetuating ecosystem. Is that, is that kind of the idea here? Yes. I was actually thinking of it as the inverse of like, oh, how can we apply these like sort of DAO models mm-hmm. to children but um because i was thinking about like tokenomics right and like there's all these things involved in it with like how how do you create systems where people are rewarded in the right way Mm -hmm. um even with like a vesting schedule i was thinking i met this crypto person who gives his kid um a choice every month of like is his allowance in like usd like cash or like roblox Mm -hmm. and i was like wow this is really cool it's almost like kind of like a vesting Mm -hmm. like option schedule um and that i don't know i was just sort of thinking about um dao people and crypto people are such nerds about incentive mechanisms and positive feedback loops and intrinsic motivation and ownership and like those are all things that like matter in like parenting Mm -hmm. too so i wonder if we'll see like a change in like with the ethos of crypto and i think this really circles back to like the very beginning of this conversation of like what are the values in crypto and like what do we care about and think about and like how does that translate um i guess across how might that translate across generations Mm -hmm. yeah and also how do we how do we like incentivize it right like how do we manifest it yeah um so when if we were to zoom out and say say DAOs get their shit together and maybe we can also answer what that even looks like. Uh, we can fa- let's fast forward like five, ten years into the future, where a lot of this idea and thought and like practice of applying some of the things that we've been talking about today on the show, and DAOs like start to like you know start to get their ball rolling. What what does your the successful versions of DAOs in the future look like? What are they doing that have helped them become successful? What do they need to do? I don't want to be prescriptive. Like, I don't Mm -hmm. think there's one right way to do DAOs. Like, I know how I personally feel about certain things within DAOs and, like, what my preferences are. Mm -hmm. But But you could also zoom out more and just say, hey, like, uh, the DAOs have figured out ways to hear their communities better. Right. We can get a little bit more meta about it. Right. I think, yeah, like, getting more meta about it. I think in a successful DAO world a few years down the line, we will see a proliferation of diversity and DAOs, both Mm -hmm. in what they're united and mobilized around and in the ways that they operate. Mm -hmm. Um, And then I also think like to get there, um, like I said before, like we need more experimentation. We need more research. We need more documentation. Um, We need to actually be like more academically, I think, rigorous about um, the about the development of this industry or space or sector Mm -hmm. within crypto. Um, Because like those peer reviewed journals I found, those are like nuggets of alpha. And like, Mm -hmm. like you would never find that on crypto Twitter. Right. And like, I literally just found them by like, I can't remember a single time I've ever seen a peer reviewed article spread on crypto Twitter. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. Like, but we need both. Right. Mm -hmm. And like, I, we, we do like, it'd be helpful. Right. In these conversations where people are like, this DAO model is failing. It doesn't work. It'd be helpful. We need evidence and data. Like I'm a very data-driven person. We need mm-hmm. data to back that up. And so we need to be able to point to um, to different DAOs that have succeeded and failed over time and actually have measurable ways of like documenting that and consolidating and presenting that information. I think that's just a, a simple call to action of like, hey, let's let's codify our learnings and make that shareable, which is kind of just like what open source is. Uh, I mean, it's, we're not writing software here. We're kind of, sometimes we are uh, with things like Orca Protocol, but like, we're just saying like, hey, we need to like share more information about like how these structures are working. And maybe that is is why I had you on the show today to talk about critical theory, because isn't that what that is? Is that is that part of like what this whole thing is? Is like spreading knowledge as to how power structures work. And we kind of yes. need our bat DAOs to have a little bit more power these days. It's knowledge and power structures all the way down for sure. Yes. yes. Parker, thank you so much for for joining me on Layer Zero. Thank you for having me. Cheers. Cheers.
Hey, we hope you enjoyed the video. If you did, head over to Bankless HQ right now to develop your crypto investing skills and learn how to free yourself from banks and gain your financial independence. We recommend joining our daily newsletter, podcast, and community as a Bankless Premium subscriber to get the most out of your Bankless experience. You'll get access to our market analysis, our alpha leaks, and exclusive content, and even the Bankless token for airdrops, raffles, and unlocks. If you're interested in crypto, the Bankless community is where you want to be. Click the link in the description to become a Bankless Premium subscriber today. Also, don't forget to subscribe to the channel for in-depth interviews with industry leaders, Ask Me Anythings, and weekly roll-ups where we summarize the week in crypto and other fantastic content. Thanks everyone for watching and being on the journey as we build out the Bankless Nation.